Okay, well, thanks very much, Andy. It's always a pleasure to be here at the NIH. I'll first disclose that I have no financial relationships. Um, what I will be talking with you about this morning, uh, several, several general areas pertinent to population genetics. First of all, we'll talk about patterns of human genetic variation, how we assess them uh, among populations, and also at the individual level. Uh, and as we go through, we'll be talking about how various evolutionary factors influence human genetic variation. One of the interesting questions that we can now address with genetic data uh, is the issue of race, which I put in quotes, uh, and the implications of what we now understand about human variation uh, biomedically. And then we'll talk uh, about another application uh, of our studies of human genetic variation, and that's in the area of linkage disequilibrium uh, and disease gene identification. Uh, and how our knowledge of human genetic variation can really form, inform us more effectively uh, in our search for disease-causing genes. So a long time ago, 1956, uh, Sewell Wright, one of the great geneticists of the last century, identified what he called the four major factors of evolution. And I think it's useful to keep those in mind as we think about what influences patterns of genetic variation. First of all, as we know, mutation can be considered the author of variation. That's where genetic variation ultimately comes from. Natural selection can be regarded as the editor of variation, uh, selecting in favor of variants that are beneficial, selecting against variants that are harmful. We can think of genetic drift, the third major factor, as the randomizer, the stochastic element in evolution. Populations that are very small can experience substantial changes over time in gene frequency as a result of this random effect. And finally, we think of gene flow, uh, the transmission of genetic material from one population to another as the homogenizer uh, in evolution. So as we go through the talk today, we'll uh, talk about various examples of each of these processes. So we've now been able to directly estimate the human mutation rate uh, as of uh, about six years ago. Uh, that was the first estimate, one that we were uh, privileged to be involved in, looking at whole genome sequence uh, in a human family, comparing parents and offspring, and finding that the human mutation rate from generation to generation is on the order of about one in a hundred million base pairs per generation. So we transmit uh, with each gamete about 30 to 35 new DNA variants. Uh, that estimate has been now confirmed in a number of subsequent studies, so we feel that we have a pretty good estimate now of the rate at which new variation enters the genomes of humans. Uh, and this is a quote uh, that I've always enjoyed from Lewis Thomas, uh, referring to genetic variation and mutation. He said, the capacity to blunder slightly is the real marvel of DNA. Without this special attribute, we would still be anaerobic bacteria and there would be no music. So this is really sort of a testament uh, to the value of mutation, of genetic variation, uh, as we adapt to a changing environment. Now, one of the interesting things uh, in studies of mutation that's come to light uh, is that most new mutations occur in the male germline. Uh, this helps to explain a pattern we've known about for a long time, the fact that with advanced paternal age, uh, the risk of having children with various autosomal dominant conditions increases several fold. Uh, by looking directly at mutation rates in families, we know now that uh, each year, an additional two or so mutations are transmitted uh, beyond age 30, probably as a result of a mitotic div division of spermatogonia over and over again as fathers age. So now we know that males are really the cause of most single gene mutations uh, in humans and in many other species. Uh, so we males can take credit for that. So one question that we can address 
looking across individuals and across species, is how much do we differ? Uh, if we look at aligned DNA bases, how much uh, do individuals, how much do species differ from one another? Now, identical twins, as nature's clones, differ essentially at none of their DNA base pairs, at least at conception. There are somatic mutations uh, that can take place later, uh, but we can say that for all intents and purposes, identical twins have zero DNA base differences. We know as a result of our sequencing studies that unrelated humans, any pair of unrelated humans, differs at about one in a thousand base pairs. And I think this is an important take home message uh, from our studies of human genetic variation. The fact that we humans are about 99.9% .9 identical at the DNA level, at this most fundamental uh, unit of our biology, uh, we are all really quite similar to each other. If we compare ourselves to our nearest relative, evolutionarily, the chimp, uh, we are about 99% similar to the chimp for aligned DNA base bases. Uh, if we include structural variants, that figure goes down to about 95% similarity. Now, if we go out a little bit further, evolutionarily, uh, we differ by about one in six to one in three base pairs from mice. And finally, if we compare ourselves to broccoli, thankfully, we're mostly different from broccoli. But with three, in, three billion DNA bases, uh, even though we differ at only about one in a thousand base pairs, that means that for any haploid sequence, there are about three million differences. So that's a lot of genetic variation, what we refer to uh, as single nucleotide variants, or SNVs. If we compare humans to other species, other great apes, we see that we are several, we have two to three times less variation uh, than the other major great ape species. So humans, compared to other great apes, relatively lacking in genetic diversity. Now another category of variation, something that we've become really quite interested in now over the last decade or so, are structural variations or structural variants. Uh, these are deletions, duplications, sometimes duplicated uh, multiple times, more than 50 base pairs or so. Uh, so that the uh, idea is illustrated here that whereas typically we have two copies of any given gene, uh, in some cases we can have more than two, uh, in some cases we can have only one. So these structural variants, uh, wh which are more difficult to identify than single nucleotide variants, uh, but we now estimate, and this is from some of the recent work from the Human Genome, uh, from the um, Thousand Genomes Project, that in the average haploid human sequence, at least nine megabases are affected by structural variants. About three and a half megabases in the average genome are affected by single nucleotide variants. So what that says is that these structural variants, even though they occur less frequently in the genome because they're much larger, account for more differences than do single nucleotide variants. And if we look at copy number variants, uh, where they, uh, genetic segments uh, can differ by multiple copies, uh, each human is heterozygous for about 150 of those CNVs. So a substantial amount of variation uh, at the structural level, something we're beginning to understand better and better. So we can address the question, how much do human populations differ? We've talked about how much individuals and species differ, uh, but we can look at population variation throughout the world. So a set of samples I'll be talking about for the next few minutes uh, are shown here, the geographic locations distributed uh, throughout the world. Uh, representing 800 individuals, 40 different populations. Uh, here you see some of the phenotypes, uh, some of the phenotypic variation observable uh, in these different populations. So we can look at variation at the population level uh, in terms of allele frequencies, and these are frequently used in population genetics. 
Uh, so here we have an array of single nucleotide variants, one, two, and three, uh, assessed in three populations. So we simply count the number, the number of alleles uh, in each population. And I'll make a distinction here. Uh, we're using the more general term, single nucleotide variants. Uh, we also, and I'm sure you're familiar with this term, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, uh, the distinction is that conventionally a polymorphism has a minor allele frequency, that is the less common allele, uh, greater than 1%. Uh, so the kinds of variants that we assess using microarrays tend to be more common. They're usually termed SNPs, uh, but the more general term, including variants of all frequency, would be single nucleotide variants. So for each of these <coughs> loci, uh, we can assess the heterozygosity, that is the proportion of heterozygous individuals uh, in each population simply by counting alleles. That is, how often uh, it, do we see heterozygotes? How often do we see homozygotes? We can then average that across loci. So if one in a thousand base pairs varies on average between a pair of individuals, how is this variation distributed between continents? A unit uh, that we often use uh, to group populations into. Uh, so this gives us some idea of how much variation there is between major populations. Uh, and to assess this, we use uh, this statistic, FST, which has been around for a long time. FST is the amount of genetic variation uh, in the entire population that is attributable to population differences, attributable to subdivision. Uh, so one simple way to measure this is to take the total heterozygosity, uh, the total variation uh, in our sample, so that's this quantity, and then we subtract from that the average heterozygosity within each population, in this case, continents. So you can imagine that if there were as much variation within each continent as there is in the total sample, then this quantity would be zero. In other words, subdivision creates no addi additional variation. Uh, if this quantity, let's say, were zero, uh, then FST would be one. So FST then measures the proportion of variation in our population due to population differences or subdivision. So here's a table summarizing for those populations that I mentioned. FST values among continental populations for a variety of different kinds of genetic systems. And some of these go back in time uh, to when we typically looked at fewer than 100 polymorphisms. Uh, and then more recently, larger numbers of SNP array polymorphisms. Uh, the the take-home point here uh, is that for any of these kinds of genetic systems with different mutational mechanisms and so forth, in all cases, our FST value is about 10 to 15 percent. That is, the great majority of variation that we see in these populations can be seen within populations. Uh, and only an additional 10 to 15 percent occurs between populations, telling us that in general, human populations tend to be fairly similar to one another. Now, it's interesting to compare these systems uh, with an FST measure based on skin pigmentation, because we can do this for quantitative phenotype measures as well. And of course, skin pigmentation has been used in classification of populations for a long time. Uh, and it's interesting that we see the flip, the opposite uh, situation for skin pigmentation, where 90% of the variation is actually seen between continents, only 10% within. Uh, so our genetic, genetically based measures show much, much less variation between continents, something like skin pigmentation, which has been un under intense natural selection in human evolution, we see much greater variation. So if we ask the question, what percentage of these SNPs are shared among major regions of the world, Africa, Europe, East Asia, and India, 
uh, and this is for about 1,000 samples using a 250K chip, uh, we see that about 80% of these relatively common SNPs, so these are SNPs with minor allele frequencies greater than 5 or 10%, about 80% are seen in all four of these groups. 88% are seen in at least three groups, more than 90% shared in at least two groups. About 7% are seen only in the African subset, only 0.5% seen in any non-African group. So more variation uh, in the African samples, a commonly observed feature. Uh, but the important point here is that for these uh, common SNPs, which are relatively old, because they have to have a certain age uh, to get to a frequency of 5 to 10 percent, those tend to be shared widely across the world. And we see that same pattern here. These are SNPs uh, from the 1000 Genomes Project. Uh, here are the uh, European ancestry populations, uh, East Asians uh, and uh, Africans, uh, the Yorubans from Nigeria. We see that the great majority of relatively common SNPs are shared among all three continental groups. And the average allele frequency difference between these major populations is about 15%. But more recently, with whole genome sequencing, it's been possible to look at less common variants, the single nucleotide variants. Uh, for these, we see that there's substantially less overlap among populations. In fact, for these three major continental populations, the great majority of single nucleotide variants are in fact population specific. For those with frequencies less than 2%, fewer than 5% of alleles are actually shared between any two pairs of continents. And intuitively this makes sense because these rare variants arose relatively recently. They arose typically out of the later than the human migration out of Africa, so they're more likely to be population specific. And as we analyze rare alleles uh, in our genetic studies and our disease-related studies, we have to keep in mind uh, that many of these, most of these rare alleles will tend to be population-specific rather than shared across populations. The same thing is true of rare, of, of uh, structural variants. So this is a figure from uh, the uh, final 1,000 genomes paper, uh, one of the final 1,000 genomes papers. Uh, looking at allele counts, so that for structural variants, uh, these would be variants that are seen only once, variants that are seen 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. And you can see for the very rare ones, they tend to be specific to one of these major populations, Africa, um, America, East Asia, Europe, or South Asia. For more common variants, we tend to see more frequently that they're shared. Uh, and once we get into the relatively common variants, that is those with more than 100 or so counts, uh, they tend to be shared in two or more populations. So that same pattern is seen for structural variants uh, as we see for single nucleotide variants. So how do we actually measure differences between populations? Well, I'll show you a simple genetic distance measure to give you an idea uh, of how we assess these differences. Uh, so these uh, values P sub I and P sub J are allele frequencies in two different populations, I and J. The distance between I and J, between those two populations, uh, is simply the difference between those allele frequencies, and we can take the absolute value. So going back to our little array, of single nucleotide variant frequencies in three populations that I showed you earlier. Uh, our distance between populations one and two can be measured first by subtracting these two frequencies from one another. That gives us a distance measure of 0 0.08 between these two populations. And then we would just average that same difference across all of our single nucleotide variants. So if we have a million of them, we would have an average of a million of these differences between populations. So really a uh, quite straightforward measure of genetic distance. We can then display these distances 
uh, in a network. So if we take one of our single nucleotide variants, uh, we can array our three populations like this. We can look at the first pair of populations, one and two. The distance between them, which is given by the difference between these two numbers, can be graphed like this. We can then average uh, their allele frequencies because they're the closest to each other. We average them, we subtract that from this allele frequency, and that gives us uh, the joining point uh, for this part of the network. So we've now displayed the relationship among these three populations in this simple network. Uh, and then, of course, once again, we would average these distances across all of our single nucleotide variants. But this gives us a handy graphical display of the genetic relationships among populations. And we call this a neighbor joining tree. Now, we can also do this at, at the individual level. And I like this example. Um, it's directly analogous to allele sharing, but in this case what we're looking at is how often members of the Supreme Court agree on decisions. Every so often the New York Times publishes this. Uh, this matrix of percent agreement was published in 2014, and so it shows uh, for each pair of Supreme Court justices how often they agree on decisions. Uh, and if we stare at this matrix for a while, we can start to see a pattern. We see that uh, Justice Ginsburg agrees with Justice Sotomayor most of the time, uh, less so with uh, Justices Alito and Thomas. But even with just nine people, you have to stare at this for a while to get the idea. Well, you can do what I just showed you uh, using percent agreement and graph a neighbor joining network like this, and you immediately see the pattern of voting in the US Supreme Court. Uh, we've even kind of color-coded it from red to blue, um, appropriately. And we see that one wing of the court, uh, these justices tend to agree with one another most of the time. These justices tend to agree with one another most of the time. Justice Kennedy uh, is a little bit out in the middle. So this gives you a very convenient graphical display. Now imagine if we have a thousand individuals and we're looking at percent allele shared for all pairs of those thousand. If we had a thousand by thousand matrix, you would have to stare at that for days to really get the pattern. You can do one of these networks very quickly and immediately see patterns. So this is a convenient way of distilling a lot of information uh, into two dimensional form. Now, these neighbor joining networks um, require a little bit of interpretation. One of the things that they don't tell us, especially when we're looking at human populations, is when populations actually split. It's sometimes misinterpreted that way, uh, but because human populations have gene flow continuously, uh, these branches, uh, unlike species networks, don't tell us anything necessarily about divergence times. Now, another way that we can represent these kinds of differences uh, at the individual or population level is through something called principal components analysis. Uh, and in population genetics, uh, we use principal components analysis all the time. If you look at the recent Thousand Genomes papers, they always have these uh, PCA plots. So I want to briefly explain what these actually mean. So let's imagine uh, that we have a series of individuals. Uh, we have a graph of their similarities. And what we're trying to do with principal components analysis is to define the major axis of variation uh, in this collection. So it's essentially a regression technique our first principal component is a line that goes through that series of points, uh, like our Supreme Court agreements, and tries to account for as much variation as possible along a single line. And then each individual here has a score along that principal component, either down here or up here. That gives us one axis of variation we can then subtract out the effect of that 
We get, then get what statisticians call the residuals, and then we can run a second principal component through our collection of data to try to account for the second greatest proportion of variation in the data. And this component is statistically independent of this one. And again, each individual will have a score on this second principal component. And that's the basic idea behind principal components analysis. Try to account for as much of the variation in your sample as you can in a limited number of dimensions. Now, if we go back to our differences between individuals, if you think about it, uh, the distance, the genetic distance between two individuals can be described with just a simple line. Just one principal component, if you've got two people, that describes all of the variation in your data. Uh, so the percentage of alleles shared here, let's say, is 90%. A line will tell us that. Now, if we have three people in our sample, we need an extra dimension. We can describe now all of the, of the variation with a plane. So three lines defining a two-dimensional surface showing that the distance here is smallest because the percentage of alleles is largest. If we had four individuals, we need three dimensions to account for all of the variation. Five individuals, we need four dimensions, four principal components, and so forth. But that gives you an idea of what we're doing in principal components analysis, reducing our data down to a limited number of dimensions so that we can see patterns more readily. And if we do a principal components analysis, one of my graduate students did this uh, for fun just a few weeks ago, uh, on our Supreme Court decisions, we again see really pretty much the same pattern that we saw on that neighbor joining tree. Uh, one wing of the court over here, Justice Breyer, is a little bit more separated on dimension two, uh, and then the other wing over here, and Scalia uh, way down on this component. Uh, so again, giving us a convenient display of similarity among these nine individuals. So going back to human populations, here is a population tree uh, that we put together uh, using autosomal alu polymorphisms. So alus, mobile elements, are really convenient genetic markers because they insert various places in the genome. Uh, if two people share an alu insertion in the same place, they must share a common ancestor in whom that insertion first occurred. So they're very convenient evolutionary markers. Here we grouped uh, our samples into various populations, uh, coded according to region of origin. And we see some interesting patterns here. We see, first of all, that populations do tend to group according to their geographic origin, reflecting the fact that through most of history, you were more likely to mate with somebody five or 10 kilometers away than somebody 5,000 kilometers away. We see more population variation in our African collection of samples. We can also, uh, because ALU systems have uh, a, an ancestral state and a derived state, either absence or presence of the insertion, we can denote an ancestral node uh, falling closest to the African group. Uh, that's one of the pieces of evidence for an African origin of all modern humans. Uh, and we also can, in uh, an exercise like this, assess statistical significance. And we see that these bootstrap support levels, 100%, 97%, uh, are really quite stable, telling us that um, these major divisions are st supported statistically. Now expanding that uh, to a larger number of single nucleotide variants in 40 populations, we see again very much the same pattern uh, with just a larger set of populations. So populations basically grouping uh, according to their geographic location. This is a completely different set of samples uh, assessed a few years ago, both for SNPs and for copy number variants. Uh, and again, completely different set of samples, we see uh, very much the same general pattern where geography uh, is correlated with genetic similarity.
Now here's a principal components plot uh, done on those samples. So now we're looking not at populations, but at individuals. Uh, we have enough data, um, a million SNPs, uh, so that for these 800 individuals, uh, we can plot each one. Uh, we see that for the first principal component, uh, the biggest source of variation is African versus other populations. Uh, the second source of variation going up and down here uh, is basically a, a west to east climb. And we can see that again, populations, individuals from populations, although there's overlap, uh, generally are arrayed according to their geographic location. And here we took a subset uh, of about 500 uh, of those individuals just for Eurasia. And what you see is basically a map of Eurasia. So here we have uh, Northwest Europe, here we have East Asia, here we have South Asia, South Asia. Uh, and you can see that these individuals tend to be arrayed according to their geographic origin, uh, telling us that uh, uh, geographic distance does have an effect on historical mating patterns. But also telling us that for any of these populations, there is overlap uh, where individuals uh, from one population overlap with those from another. Now another pattern we see when we look at these data uh, is that the diversity of haplotypes, that is linked groups of SNPs, SNPs close together on the same chromosome when we look at them together and form a haplotype, Diversity is highest in Africa, uh, lower in Asia and Europe, still lower in Polynesia, still lower in the Americas. So basically, with, as we proceed out of Africa, the amount of diversity tends to become smaller and smaller. And this is consistent with what we call a serial founder effect, a form of genetic drift, that randomizing component I mentioned earlier. So that with distance from Africa, there is increasing genetic drift because as populations came out of Africa, they were a subset. With smaller population size, there's greater genetic drift, less diversity. Uh, and as we proceed further out of Africa, subsets of that subset colonized other parts of the world. Uh, so we refer to this as a serial founder effect. Founder effect after founder effect after founder effect uh, as we go across the world. And all of this is consistent uh, with this hypothesis of a recent African origin of anatomically modern humans, which is now pretty well accepted uh, in uh, the, the um, population genetics arena. Uh, the idea that uh, about, sorry, about 40 to 80,000 years ago, uh, Anatomically modern humans, people who look pretty much like us, uh, came out of Africa, colonized Eurasia, and ultimately later colonized uh, the New World, uh, and even later, Polynesia. Uh, and as I'll mention after a little bit, uh, there is evidence of mixture with other more archaic populations as humans came out of Africa. But the basic idea, humans anatomically modern humans arising in Africa about 200,000 years ago, accumulating genetic variation, then a subset of that population going out to colonize the rest of the world. Now, this is an alternative model, uh, one that I ran across uh, in the supermarket uh, oh, a decade or so ago. Uh, I, I saw this headline that Adam and Eve's skeletons had been stolen. Now, I didn't even know that they had been found, but uh, that aroused my curiosity. So I actually uh, bought this copy of the Weekly World News uh, because, uh, as it says here, there are more amazing photos inside. What I learned was that all, all that's left is Eve's leg, and the identity of the perpetrator may have been established. So, as I said, an alternative model, uh, but one that uh, our data don't support very well. So we can use uh, principal components uh, to actually finally distinguish 
among populations, even populations that are relatively closely related. This is from a recent analysis we did that includes a couple of populations from Tibet, two different linguistic groups from Tibet, uh, located just a few hundred miles from each other. Uh, but with principal components analysis, we can actually distinguish them from each other pretty well. Again, each dot represents an individual. Uh, here are two different populations of Mongolians, uh, one high altitude, one low altitude. So with enough data, uh, we can distinguish individuals uh, from various populations with some degree of accuracy. This is a similar analysis uh, that was published a few years ago in Nature by John Novambra of 3,000 Europeans doing again a principal components analysis. So here's the first principal component uh, that essentially gives us a northwest, uh, northwest to southeast climb uh, and then a second independent principal component. And what's interesting about this uh, is that these individuals are to a large extent arrayed according to country of origin. Now, there was a stipulation that three of, three of four grandparents had to come from the same country. Uh, so that essentially limited recent, the, effects of, limited the effects of recent gene flow. Uh, but you can see that essentially what this gives you back is a map of Europe. Again, with overlap uh, among populations for these individuals, but in general, uh, a fairly good map of Europe. In fact, on average, people could be traced back to their place of origin within about 300 kilometers. Now, I just have to show this slide. This is a principal components analysis that we published uh, more than 30 years ago, uh, showing essentially the same thing using only 15 loci. Uh, this is at the population level. Had we used individuals, uh, we wouldn't have been able to see much of a pattern. But by looking at, at allele frequencies uh, in these populations for just 15 loci, and these were old-fashioned blood groups and protein polymorphisms, uh, we were able to essentially recreate uh, that map of Europe. Uh, since we were in Utah, we also looked at the uh, Utah Mormon or LDS population and showed that uh, they're actually quite similar uh, to the populations from which they were derived, indicating uh, a lack of genetic drift in that population. But the bottom line here, uh, genetic distances, for the most part, recapitulate uh, ancestry, geographic location, and history. Now, the data that I've been showing you so far been primarily SNP array data and other systems. Uh, now that we can do whole genome sequencing, uh, we can learn a lot more about population history. Uh, one of the problems with most micro, micro arrays is that the polymorphisms were selected initially for higher frequency and diversity, primarily in studied European populations. Uh, there are some microarrays that attempt uh, to get around that, but for the most part, uh, this is the case. In contrast with complete DNA sequences, uh, we have an unbiased representation of each genome, and we get not just common variants, but also rare ones. Uh, and we can use techniques like the coalescence method uh, to infer things like population sizes in the past. And I'll show you a simple example of that. So this is a paper uh, published by Andy Clark more than a decade ago showing that effect of ascertainment bias on allele frequencies uh, when using microarrays. So from the HapMap samples, uh, if we look at what we call the allele frequency spectrum, so basically we say what proportion of SNPs uh, have minor allele counts of one, two, three, four, and so on. So this represents the proportion of SNPs that would be very rare uh, in our data set. And you can see that for HapMap, uh, the proportion of rare SNPs is relatively small. It's underrepresented compared to what we would expect at equilibrium between mutation and drift. Uh, and it's substantially less than what we see uh, in complete sequence data sets, like a per, uh, one from Perligen and one from the NIEHS. So bottom line, with, these, with microarray data, there's an important part of the spectrum var of variation that is substantially underestimated. <laughs> 
So more recently, we've been able to look at exome data in this paper uh, published uh, several years ago in Science. And now what we see for both African-American and European-American uh, individuals that they looked at, uh, in this bin, uh, where minor, frequency, minor allele frequencies are 0.5% or less, there's actually a substantial excess of variation. And what that excess tells us is that human populations have undergone a massive recent expansion. So how does that work? Well, um, and, and in fact, if we, if we look at the percentages, what that study indicated was that 73% of all protein coding variants, uh, and even more, 86% of deleterious SNVs have arisen in just the last five or 10,000 years as a result of massive human expansions. So to understand why expansion gives us an excess of rare alleles, think about a family. Uh, if we have this small family, quartet, uh, and a new variant arises on this chromosome copy, there's actually a good chance that that variant will simply go extinct. Uh, there are only two offspring, so the chance that neither of them will get the variant is one quarter. So even though a new variant has occurred, it's immediately lost. Now in contrast, if this were a very large family, that variant occurs, the extinction probability is only one half to the tenth, that is one in a thousand. Chances are at least one offspring uh, will inherit that new variant. And if they have a lot of offspring, chances are it will be transmitted again. So uh, families like this would be seen in a rapidly expanding population. In a population like that, we're going to see an excess of rare alleles that would, in a constant population, tend to be lost due to drift. So that signature that we commonly see in these human allele frequency spectra uh, is a good reflection of this large expansion in human population uh, that took place largely after the advent of agriculture. So the most complete summary we have now of sequence data like this comes from the Thousand Genomes Project. Um, the final paper was published uh, in Nature just last year. Uh, based on 2,500 individuals uh, from 26 different populations. Here you see how they're distributed across the world. Uh, and this has turned out to be a, a very, very useful reference uh, for human genetic variation. Now, I won't go through this very large table uh, in any detail, uh, but I think it's, it's a very useful summary of human genetic variation for a whole, whole series of different kinds of polymorphisms. You can see SNPs indels, copy number variants, uh, mobile elements, and so forth. One of the patterns that emerges here is that uh, in African populations, there is about 20% more variation uh, than in others. In Native American populations, the variation tends to be somewhat less. This graph summarizes uh, for each individual the number of variant sites uh, per genome. Uh, so here we see kind of at the lower end, members of this population. So this is a Finnish population, Great Britain. Uh, this is the uh, Ceph from Utah. Uh, and you see that they tend to be at the lower end of the spectrum of variation. These are Native American populations uh, that tend to be mixed uh, from various sources. Uh, so some of them have relatively low variation, others more, uh, and then these, our African populations, where we tend to see the highest level of variation, uh, and for African American populations, depending on the degree of African contribution to the genome, uh, for any individual, there may be more or less variation. But this is a very uh, convenient display, I think, of human genetic variation across the world uh, from the Thousand Genomes data set. Now, this is another. Uh, big study of human genetic variation designed very differently from 1,000 genomes. Uh, and we've uh, been involved in this one with uh, David Reich at Harvard, the Simons Genome Diversity Project, uh, where 300 people from 142 different populations across the world 
have been sequenced and at a fairly high depth, that 40x sequencing. The average depth for 1,000 genomes was about 7x. As you can see, uh, these populations very, very widely distributed across the world. So we think that this gives us a very good indication of genetic diversity in a much broader sample uh, of human populations. Uh, these papers are just starting to come out. This one came out in Science last year. There's another one uh, on uh, single nucleotide variation currently under review. Uh, but the Science paper looked at copy number variation in these samples. And uh, this, these are principal components plots uh, re showing essentially the patterns similar to what we've seen in our other kinds, uh, studying other kinds of systems. Uh, this plot looks at heterozygosity in, in uh, copy number variants for deletions and duplications. The basic pattern here, greater variation in Africa than elsewhere. Uh, we also see that there's a quite strong correlation in heterozygosity for single nucleotide variants versus copy number variants. Uh, so the two different kinds of systems, even though they have different mutational mechanisms, give us quite a similar pattern of variation across populations. So I mentioned that we can use the coalescence method uh, with sequence data to estimate important parameters of population history. And so the basic idea behind coalescence is that we can look at a sample of individuals in the present day uh, and we can assess for any particular allele. Here we have three copies of an allele in this sample. We can estimate the coalescence time, that is how far back in time a common ancestor for these individuals would be found uh, in whom that variant arose. Uh, so for these two, we have a coalescence here. Uh, and then for the other one, we have a coalescence further back in time here. But what we're looking for is where in time we can find the common ancestor for a given allelic variant. So all three of them would coalesce uh, back some number of generations in the past. Now, if you think about this intuitively, if we have a very large population with a long history, these coalescence events will tend to occur many, many generations back in time. Whereas if we have a small population with little variation, coalescences will tend to occur relatively recently. So we can analyze the pattern of coalescences in a series of genetic data to infer pre previous population sizes. And we can also infer uh, exchanges, that is gene flow, between populations uh, by looking at shared co coalescence events uh, and shared genomic segments. So this allows us uh, to make a model of human population history uh, that looks like this. So here we have a demographic model of the history of our species, uh, the line width here corresponds to the effective population size, uh, and this goes back 150,000 years ago. And essentially what we're seeing here is a larger African founding population, and then a small subset with a size of only 1,800 or so going off to colonize the rest of the world, undergoing substantial bottleneck in size, uh, a bottleneck for European populations of about 1,000, for Asian of about 500, and then subsequent rapid expansion of these populations after 20,000 years or so ago. So with sequence data, we can actually infer these parameters with substantial accuracy. How large was the previous human population? Uh, what were the major patterns of gene flow among populations? So this really helps us to understand and interpret patterns of genetic variation in populations, including the variation that gives rise to disease. So the population bottleneck that we observe here uh, explains the reduction in human genetic diversity that I showed you earlier, humans compared to other great apes. And the recent expansion explains the excess of rare alleles, some of which are disease-causing, uh, that we see in humans. <laughs>
Now, another thing uh, that some of my colleagues have been able to do is to compare ancient Neanderthal sequences with those of humans. Uh, Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans diverged about a half a million years ago, but then, as I showed you in that graph earlier, uh, as modern humans came out of Africa, they intermixed with Neanderthals, and now by comparing human and Neanderthal sequences, uh, we know that uh, on average, non-Africans have about 1% to 4% Neanderthal DNA. Uh, and some of that DNA um, is involved with things like skin pigmentation, there are some immune response genes. So these are things that some of our ancestors probably got from Neanderthals that may have actually had adaptive significance. And if you send your DNA off to a direct-to-consumer testing company, uh, they will actually estimate your own proportion of Neanderthal DNA, which is kind of amusing. Now we can also do this kind of analysis if we have sequence data from specific populations. Uh, so uh, one of the heavily studied human populations is the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And so this is a diagram going back in time uh, showing essentially the uh, effective size of ancestral populations here at 20,000, expanding the Ashkenazi population recently, receiving a lot of gene flow uh, from European populations, estimated at about 50% of that population. Uh, that is 50% of Ashkenazi DNA uh, coming from nearby European populations. This is work that uh, Harry Oster recently published. Uh, and then very recently, about 700 AD, the Ashkenazi population estimated to have undergone a bottleneck, reducing the population to only about 300, the effective population size. Now this is pretty remarkable, uh, that the subsequent population, which is then expanded substantially, would be derived from a founding population effectively of about 300 people. That helps to explain the high frequency of several disease-causing variants in the Ashkenazi population. For example, uh, about one in 40 uh, Ashkenazi uh, individuals has one of three founder mutations in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes. Uh, one in 200 in the general population. Uh, there is an APC mutation causing colorectal cancer seen in 6% of that population. Uh, and of course, everyone is familiar uh, with the lysosomal storage disorders like Tay-Sachs and Neiman-Pick, Gaucher, uh, that are, again, relatively common in that population. All of this can be ascribed to that extreme bottleneck that occurred uh, about 1,300 years ago in that population. So we have, I think, a good explanation uh, for the variant frequencies of these conditions uh, in that specific population now that we've been able to look at whole genome sequences. Uh, and conversely, there are a number of diseases common in other populations, rare in this one, because drift, of course, works in both directions. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what genetics uh, can tell us about this, um, I think, always controversial concept of human race. Uh, and I put race in quotes because I don't actually use the term myself in my own uh, writing, uh, but it is used and it is debated. Uh, and there have been a whole series of articles uh, debating the utility of the concept. Uh, this was a paper in the New England Journal now about 15 years ago asserting that race is biologically meaningless. Uh, this was a response in the New York Times uh, uh, from a psychiatrist who uses racial categories in helping to uh, decide dosages of uh, psychotropic drugs. Uh, very recently, uh, there was a nice piece in Science uh, uh, advocating taking race out of human genetics. And then uh, this piece in Scientific American uh, by my former trainee Mike Bomshad and Steve Olson, a science writer, asked the question, does race exist? Now, the thing I found amusing about this was that uh, here it says science has the answer. Um, I'm always a little skeptical when it's claimed that science has the answer. Usually we have more than one. But I think that science can tell us something about this concept and can illuminate our understanding uh, of the concept of human race.
So this is an exercise where we looked at uh, sequence variation uh, in a single human gene, the angiotensinogen gene, involved uh, in the renin-angiotensin pathway uh, that regulates blood pressure. So what we did was to sequence just that gene and then compare individuals in Asia, Europe, and Africa. And when we, what we found was for that single gene, sometimes an individual from, say, Africa, so each of these tips represents one individual, sometimes you can see that someone from Africa is actually genetically more similar to someone from Asia, someone from Europe, more similar to someone from Africa than to other Europeans. So for a single gene, and we see this often for individual genes, uh, people from completely different continents can be more similar to each other uh, than people from the same continent. And this actually essentially rediscovers something that Darwin said uh, more than a century ago. Uh, it can be doubted whether any character can be named which is distinctive of a race and is constant. In other words, there is no single character that we can use, a gene or anything else, that is always present in one population, always absent in another. And this reflects the shared history of humans and the fact that no human population uh, has been completely isolated for a, a long period of time. Uh, we are a complex mixture uh, of populations going back through time. Now, we repeated this exercise using, at that time, 190 polymorphisms. And now what you see in this neighbor-joining network uh, is that individuals from East Asia, from Europe, and from Sub-Saharan Africa uh, do fall into three groups. Now, these branch lengths are very long, again, repeating uh, what we said earlier, that most variation is found within pop these populations, but there is enough detectable variation between populations, that 10 or 15% that we talked about, uh, so that we can see three groups. Now these are, I think it's important to point out, geographically separated, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, and then East Asia, so that tends to make them fall into groups. But what we see is that with more markers, with more variation, we do see some reflection of geographic distance uh, and ancestral history. And to, I think, clarify this, if we use a simple example, we can look at height in females and in males. And if we simply look at one character, there's going to be a substantial overlap between males and females. If we add another character, like waist-hip ratio, that overlap is going to tend to decrease. So looking at more characters, we learn more about population history, uh, and we tend uh, to see that reflected in our genetic data. Here's another exercise that I think brings the point home. Here we looked at about 500 people. Uh, if we just use 10 SNPs and then do a principal components plot, uh, the kind that I told you about earlier. Here we're doing it actually in three dimensions, so we have a third dimension that kind of comes up out of the paper. Uh, we really don't see any pattern here with just 10 SNPs. It's really very little information. If we use 100 SNPs, we start to see some organization uh, by population affiliation. If we look at 1,000 SNPs, we can actually see Again, these major continental groups, individuals um, essentially grouping together. And with 10,000 SNPs, uh, the pattern uh, is even more clear. So if we have enough information, we can begin to discern something about ancestry. So with multiple polymorphisms, we can, to some extent, predict population affiliation uh, because there is enough distinct variation uh, to allow us to do that, but only with a lot of data. Now, I think a very important point here, and this really gets back to the controversy, is that population affiliation can't, in turn, predict individual genotypes or traits. Uh, so we can go in one direction, but we really can't go back in the other. Uh, and that's because 
These traits, genotypes, do tend to be primarily shared across populations. They differ in frequencies, uh, but there are very few that would be present in all members of one population absent in all members of another population. So I think this is one of the fallacies that has to be avoided is that if we have a self-described population affiliation, we can't make inferences necessarily about genotypes. Uh, this is a principal components analysis that we did just very recently using the thousand genomes data. Uh, so here uh, we have a series of populations uh, from um, Europe, from Africa, from Asia, and then we also have the African American individuals included in the Thousand Genomes Project. The important point here is that there are a number of African Americans in this plot uh, that would be more similar genetically uh, to the Asian or European populations uh, than to African populations because of the complex history of mixture in uh, that population. And so that tells us that there is a lot of genetic variation in the African American population uh, and that you really can't necessarily ascribe individuals uh, to a specific population group and that individual ancestry would be really much more informative here. And that really, I think, underscores the fallacy of thinking typologically when we think about human populations. If we think about humans as belonging to types or, quote, races, we tend to put them uh, into discrete boxes when, in fact, our studies of genetic variation tell us that, for the most part, variation is overlapping among populations. Uh, and I think it's more informative, really, to think of each of us in terms of our individual ancestry. For example, here, an individual who has a genetic constitution uh, that is 90% African, 10% European, would probably self-identify as African-American. But somebody with a more complex ancestral legacy uh, would possibly also identify as African-American, but genetically, uh, they're very different. And I think that illustrates why individual ancestry rather than the traditional concept of race, is going to be more informative, especially uh, as we deal with individual people, individual patients. Now, I wanted to just give you an example uh, of individual ancestry. Using my own ancestry, I sent my DNA off to one of the uh, direct-to-consumer companies just for fun a few years ago. Uh, and it was interesting to uh, get the results back. How many of you have sent your DNA to a... a one of these companies. Well, a few people have done it. Okay. Well, it is interesting. You know, they call it recreational genomics, so it has to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, but it it, uh, it is kind of fun to look at the results. Uh, these are my Y chromosome results. Uh, so I have a haplogroup uh, that is seen with greatest frequency in Northwest Europe. Uh, that's where my grandfather said they were from. They said they were from Norway. So this agrees with my own uh, family history, as far as I know it. Now, one of the interesting things is that this Y haplogroup, uh, I share it with Jimmy Buffett and Warren Buffett. Um, hasn't done anything for my singing or my investing ability, uh, but uh, a little interesting factoid. Now, my mitochondrial genome uh, was also examined. Highest frequency for that, again, in primarily Western Europe, but you can see that that mitochondrial haplogroup is uh, fairly generally distributed uh, across Europe and into Asia and Africa. Now, another thing that is done, and we can do this uh, with, uh, with our DNA sequences, uh, is something that uh, they refer to as ancestry painting. Uh, so essentially, for each chromosome segment uh, in a person, in this case in me, uh, we look at which alleles are present, and then we ask the question, in which continent uh, is that allele most frequent? Uh, and so that gives you sort of a paint across the chromosomes. I was sort of disappointed to see that I have a pretty boring genome uh, with, at least according to this, all of my ancestry uh, from Europe, and on a finer level, uh, almost all of it from Scandinavia. 
Uh, but as far as I know my history, uh, that is consistent. But it tells us that our DNA, having reflecting, or reflecting uh, all of the events that have occurred in our past, migrations, bottlenecks, and so forth, can tell us something about our ancestral origin. Though, as I said, we have to take this with a grain of salt because uh, the reference samples uh, are somewhat limited. Populations have moved over hundreds and thousands of years, uh, but it is sort of interesting to see the pattern. Now, we can contrast this with the pattern seen for a self-identified African-American uh, male. Uh, so we see the ancestry painting, and one half of the chromosome would be paternal, the other half uh, maternal. Uh, and we see that uh, for this person, about 33% of ancestry is traced to Africa, about 64% uh, to Europe. Now, the important point here is that for, let's say, a medically relevant locus, uh, let's say one pertaining to hypertension, um, this person at the individual level may well be European rather than African, and what that tells us is that we should really be looking at individual ancestry uh, rather than self-described population affiliation uh, to assess more accurately someone's genetic inheritance. And so that's one of the implications of these findings, I think, for biomedical research. Uh, certainly, if we look at a large number of DNA polymorphisms, we can learn something about ancestry, about population history, though uh, it can be ra rather approximate. Uh, but the variants that we're looking at typically just differ in their frequency across populations, uh, and there is, as we've seen, substantial overlap among populations. Uh, so this is one of the implications. This is an interesting meta-analysis uh, published of blood pressure response to ACE inhibitors. Uh, and here we see the decrease in systolic blood pressure in two populations, European American and African American. Um, and we see that there is, on average, about a five millimeter difference uh, between the two groups uh, in the amount of blood pressure decrease after the administration of an ACE inhibitor. But the important point here is that there is substantial overlap between these two distributions. Uh, so uh, many persons uh, in this population could benefit more from an ACE inhibitor than persons in this population. Again, stressing the importance of treating each patient as an individual rather than uh, a member of a self-described, self-defined population. Here's another example. Um, EGFR inhibitors uh, used in the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. So uh, uh, both gefitinib and erlotinib uh, are small molecule inhibitors of EGFR tyrosine kinase activity. Uh, it's interesting that they have been found to be effective in about 10% of Europeans with non-small cell lung cancer, about 30% of Asians. So there is a population difference in response to EGFR inhibitors. But if we look at the gene directly at somatic gain of function mutations in EGFR, we see that those gain of function mutations, for reasons that aren't well understood, are more common in Asians than in Europe, than in Europeans. And in fact, about 70 to 80 percent of patients who have those mutations respond to gefitinib. Fewer than 10 percent of those without the mutations respond to that drug. So looking at individuals and looking at their own sequence differences at EGFR, much more predictive of response to this drug than looking at population affiliation. Uh, so I think this is, again, a good example of individualized, personalized medicine looking directly at genes rather than uh, using uh, population categories. So I think uh, for the issue of genetic variation in race, uh, we, we, we see that genetic variation is indeed correlated uh, with geographic origin, uh, but it tends to be distributed uh, often continuously across space. That means it's hard to define precise borders 
between populations. Uh, so I think what it says is that race, while it may not be completely meaningless biologically, we can see differences at the DNA level among populations, but it's biologically very imprecise. It's a blunt tool. Uh, we can do better uh, with genetic analysis. Uh, and by looking at individual ancestry, I think we can get ultimately much more useful uh, medical information. Uh, so I think in that way, genetics has, has uh, increased, has enhanced our understanding of differences and similarities among populations. And of course, there's nothing uh, in our genetic results that would suggest that one population is in any way uh, superior or inferior to another. Now, the last topic I want to uh, mention today, another application of our studies of genetic variation, pertains to the use of linkage disequilibrium in disease gene mapping. And let me just ask the audience here, how many of you are familiar with the concept of linkage disequilibrium? Okay, about maybe a third. So let's go through a quick definition. Um, basically, uh, linkage disequilibri disequilibrium refers to the non-random association of alleles at linked loci. So if we imagine in a population that we have two loci, we'll call them A and B, and they both have alleles big A and little a, big B and little b, uh, at equilibrium, we're going to see pretty much a random assortment of haplotypes containing either big A and big B, little a and little b, big A and little b, and so forth. Whereas under disequilibrium, we see a preferential assortment of haplotypes. Here, big A and big B, little a and little b. And we can actually quantify this using allele frequencies. Uh, if the frequencies of big A and little a in our population are 60 and 40%, of big B and little b, 70 and 30%, then we would predict under equilibrium, if there is no preferential assortment uh, of these linked alleles on chromosomes, we would expect that if we surveyed a population, in 42% of our chromosome copies, we would see big A and big B together on the same copy of a chromosome because that's simply the product of their allele frequencies, 60% times 40%. We would expect to see big A and little b 18% of the time, 60% times 30%, and so on. That's at equilibrium. There, our population uh, frequencies of haplotypes is predicted exactly by the individual allele frequencies. Uh, if they are independent, we can simply multiply them together. But let's suppose we see this pattern instead, where instead of 42% of our haplotypes having big A and big B, it's 60%. And instead of 12% instead of, of our haplotypes having little a and little b, it's 30%. Well, that's a substantial deviation from what we would expect under independence. Uh, that would be an instance of linkage disequilibrium. The preferential association of these two alleles, the preferential association of these two alleles. And what that typically reflects is the distance between loci. Because if you think about it, over time, over many generations, loci that are further apart, like A and B, have had more time in which recombinations can occur to shuffle the combinations. These two loci, being very close together, have had less time for recombination to occur. So ultimately, we're more likely uh, to see an association of alleles between these two very closely linked loci than between these two more distantly linked loci. So linkage disequilibrium essentially reflects this pattern of recombination occurring over many, many hundreds of generations, especially for closely linked loci. So we can use it to infer the distance between closely linked loci. Now, there are a number of factors that affect these patterns. Chromosome location, uh, for example, we know that uh, within genes, there tends to be less linkage disequilibrium than outside of genes. Uh, we know that DNA sequence patterns, things like GC content, um, influence linkage disequilibrium, less disequilibrium, more recombination, where we have a higher GC content. 
Also, allo elements have been shown uh, to increase local recombination rates. And we know now that every 50 or 100 KB or so, uh, there are recombination hotspots, where recombination activity is elevated about tenfold over the general level of recombination in the genome. Uh, one of the factors uh, involved in that is a zinc finger protein called PRDM9. Uh, that's associated with close to half of hotspots uh, and actually varies among populations uh, and accounts for some of the variation in recombination that we see among human populations. And of course, evolutionary factors affect linkage disequilibrium. All of the factors that we mentioned earlier, selection, gene flow, mutation, genetic drift, uh, can affect linkage disequilibrium uh, through the history of populations. And also the time that has elapsed since a population was founded. Populations that were founded a long time ago, more time for recombination to occur. Uh, in general, less linkage disequilibrium. And this is borne out in the 1,000 Genomes data. This is the most recent uh, version showing that this group of populations has a more rapid decay of linkage disequilibrium between SNP pairs. So here is the distance in KB between each pair of SNPs in the population. And then this is a measure of linkage disequilibrium between each pair. Uh, and we see that for all of the populations from Africa, there is a more rapid decline of disequilibrium with physical distance uh, than in other populations. Uh, and for, for example, the Finnish population, a somewhat less rapid decline, uh, reflecting the more recent founding of that population. So this is a nice illustration of how the, essentially the age of populations influences patterns of linkage disequilibrium. Uh, but the bottom line from these studies is that because many SNPs in the genome are in linkage disequilibrium, they're redundant. Uh, so in our genotyping studies, we only need to type a subset. So for example, uh, if this person has this allele C at this position, they're more likely to have T and A at this position. Whereas if somebody has G at this position, more likely to have C and C at, this at those positions. So the alleles are in linkage disequilibrium, and that means that we really only have to type this one in order to know what these most likely are. So we can designate those as tag SNPs. And something that our studies of genetic variation have told us is that we can get relatively complete coverage of a genome in a genome-wide association study with something like one and a half million SNPs for African-derived populations, because there's less linkage disequilibrium there, uh, and something like a half million to a million SNPs for non-African populations, because there's more linkage disequilibrium. So our, our studies of population history then can inform, help to inform our design of these genome-wide association studies, our design of SNP microarrays. Uh, and that successful design has led to uh, these kinds of findings. Uh, I think you'll hear more about this later, uh, but uh, the uh, many thousands of significant associations now seen between various SNPs uh, and traits in human populations. Now recombination hotspots um, are also, we've, we've been informed about these through studies of linkage disequilibrium. Uh, as I mentioned, there's one every, 50 to 100,000 base pairs in the human genome. And we estimate now that about 60% of all recombination occurs in just 6% of the genome at, at uh, these hotspots. Uh, and very interestingly, hotspots aren't actually congruent in humans and chimps. They're, they're very different from one another, indicating rapid evolution of hotspot activity uh, in primate species. Now, natural selection uh, creates regions of strong linkage disequilibrium. So we can use linkage disequilibrium actually uh, to learn something about natural selection in populations. And this, this diagram uh, illustrates the principle. If we imagine that a new variant arises here on a chromosome background, there will be SNPs uh, nearby that are going to be in strong linkage disequilibrium because Whenever we see this variant, we're going to see these SNPs 
But through time, recombination is going to shuffle these so that a smaller and smaller haplotype through time is going to be associated with that variant. So under neutrality, that is where there is no selection, this variant will increase in frequency only very slowly so that by the time it uh, attains a frequency of say 10%, it's on a relatively small associated SNP haplotype background. But if there's been rapid positive selection for that variant, it will essentially drag the nearby SNPs along with it and you will see a region of high linkage disequilibrium uh, because this variant has evolved quickly to high frequency, so quickly that recombination hasn't had time to reshuffle these nearby SNPs. Uh, so this is one of the signatures that we look at in genomes to indicate that that region has been under recent rapid selection. And we now have some good examples uh, in humans uh, where there are extended regions of disequilibrium and homozygosity uh, that are the result of recent rapid selection. G6PD for malaria, one of the cytochrome P450s for sodium retention, uh, lactase enhancer for hereditary lactase persistence, uh, several skin pigmentation loci, and this one that I'll just talk about for a couple of minutes here at the end, a uh, high altitude hypoxia response. Uh, two genes in the uh, hypoxia-inducible factor pathway. So if we look in Tibetan populations, and this is work that we've published uh, over the last few years, uh, we see that Tibetans have regions of elevated linkage disequilibrium, extended homozygosity uh, for these two genes uh, that are both in the hypoxia-inducible factor pathway and also for uh, oxygen sensing genes, in particular this heme oxygenase 2 gene. So the yellow uh, indicates the ancestral allele, the red is the more recent derived selected allele, and what we see here is that for uh, individuals, so each row here is an individual, and each column is a SNP, we have large regions uh, of extended homozygosity, of extended linkage disequilibrium. This is a signature of recent positive selection. In this case, uh, for genes uh, that affect response to hypoxia. And these populations, Tibetan populations, live at an average elevation of 14,000 feet, uh, where they have about 30% less oxygen than we have here at sea level. These selected haplotypes are associated uh, in Tibetan populations with reduced hemoglobin levels. Now that might seem paradoxical, because you would think at high altitude you would want to make more red blood cells, more hemoglobin, in response to low oxygen. And that, that in fact, is what we do. Our acute response uh, to high altitude is to increase erythropoiesis, make more red blood cells. The problem with that is that that makes us susceptible to high altitude pulmonary edema, high altitude cerebral edema. It clogs up our circulation. Tibetans have evolved so that they can live at high altitude with reduced hemoglobin levels, protecting them against polycythemia, against uh, increased numbers of red blood cells. And this is uh, an experiment uh, that we did, putting the uh, Tibetan specific mutations in the prolyl hydroxylase gene uh, into erythroid progenitor cells. This is the wild type under normoxia, and under hypoxia in this, these uh, uh, in vitro systems, uh, the wild type actually increases activity. In other words, erythropoiesis is going up. This is what we would do at high altitude. Here are the uh, Tibetan mutation cells with the Tibetan variants in prolyl hydroxylase uh, at normoxia. Under hypoxia, activity decreases. So recapitulating the Tibetan phenotype in a cell culture's uh, system. Uh, so I think this is a nice uh, example of how we can go back, look at sequence variation in populations to better understand how they have adapted uh, to interesting environmental conditions. In this case, very, very uh, low oxygen availability. Uh, and this is from a paper just under review now 
so this is a genome-wide selection experiment uh, taking advantage now of whole sequence data. Uh, and what we see is that these two genes in the hypoxia-inducible factor pathway are by far uh, the genes under strongest selection in the Tibetan population. And by the way, this one, EPAS1, uh, was contributed to that population by an ancient population called the Denisovans, which were sister species of the Neanderthals. So this was one of those genetic adaptations, uh, in this case to high altitude, uh, that came into this population from a completely different source. So I think a very interesting story. So population genetics, to sum up, is I think helping to guide uh, the development of new sequence analysis resources. Uh, the Thousand Genomes Project is a great example uh, where those data are used as reference sequences or control sequences in thousands of analyses. Uh, we've learned, uh, among other things, from those data that rare variants tend to be population specific, as we saw. Uh, we're also learning a lot about the functional significance of these genetic variants uh, because uh, we know that functional regions in the genome, whether coding or non-coding, tend to show more evidence of purifying selection. And we can actually use those to more effectively identify uh, functional regions of the genome. So to sum up uh, what I've told you about today, uh, genetic variation uh, does contain, I think, useful information about population history, about individual ancestry, uh, our studies of individual variation, I think, do give us uh, a more informed, a more sophisticated view of the concept of race uh, and its relevance or lack of relevance to medicine. Um, population genetic analysis has informed us, I think, in very important ways uh, about linkage disequilibrium, the effect of evolutionary factors on it, and how we can most effectively apply it in disease gene mapping. Uh, and I think that our analyses of population genetics are going to become even more important now uh, as we come to understand the role of rare variants uh, in disease, now that we can relatively cheaply obtain whole genome sequences. And finally, I hope that you've seen, I hope you agree with me, uh, that population genetics actually can be quite a lot of fun. We can learn some really interesting things from it. Uh, and with the avalanche of data now coming in, I think over the next decade or two, we're going to learn uh, even more. So thank you all very much. Okay, so given the hour, we'll just take questions at the podium. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you all again next week.